you hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. All right, y'all, introducing our good friend Gareth Porter, author of the book on the Iranian nuclear program, Manufactured Crisis, the truth behind the Iranian nuclear scare, and, of course, a million great articles for uh, Truth Out and Middle East Eye and Antiwar.com. We run pretty much all of it, uh, all his old IPS news stuff and everything else. Uh, the great Gareth Porter, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Gareth? I'm fine. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be back. All right, so I think everybody in the world knows that the Iranians have completely bent over backwards to live up to their end of the nuclear deal. All that uh, smoke that was blown last summer about how, oh, they're going to exploit all these loopholes to sneak their secret nuclear weapons program out the back door of their military bases, and <laughs> all these things have come completely to naught. Uh, the Parchin facility has been inspected, uh, the IAEA uh, routinely celebrates Iranian cooperation with the new and improved and expanded terms of the additional protocol and the subsidiary arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then the other side of the deal is America and the EU and the UN and the sanctions. And could you please give us a progress report about where we're at with that? Well, I'll do my best, Scott. I mean, this is, this is, in my view, and I think it's fair to say in the view of others as well, more complicated uh, than any of the actual nuclear related issues uh, that were part of the agreement or that were in the negotiations. And that's because of the vast array, frankly, of uh, of uh, sanctions which the U.S. government has imposed on Iran over the years, really going back to the early to mid 1990s. Um, and, and most of these sanctions, of course, had nothing to do with the nuclear program. They were imposed, um, over various, uh, <laughs> issues, real or imagined. Uh, and, and I would argue, uh, essentially that it, they were all very issues. Uh, many of them, some of them had to do with, with terrorism and some of them with human rights, uh, and all these in quotes. But, um, I mean, the real reason, of course, was that the Israelis and their followers in the United States wanted the United States to punish uh, and isolate and weaken Iran. And, and the uh, uh, various administrations since then have been uh, very willing to do exactly that. And uh, so this is really the, the fruit of, uh, of the domestic politics of the United States surrounding the issue of Iran, which all have to do with Israel. But, I mean, the, the effect of this is to create uh, a whole set of uh, sanctions which um, really have nothing to do with the agreement itself, uh, nothing to do with the issues of the agreement itself, but which affect the, um, the Iranian economy, obviously, and particularly their ability to do business with uh, banks and businesses outside the United States. Now, of course, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to do business with U.S. institutions because uh, of the sanctions that apply to domestic institutions are still on the books. Um, and, and the Iranians knew that all along. So that's not really an issue. But what is an issue is the effect that the sanctions that still remain on the books have on the understanding, the willingness of banks and uh, businesses abroad to do business with Iran, um, and uh, part of it has to do with uh, the fact that so much business uh, in the world, whether banks or other companies, courses through uh, major banks in the United States, um, and that that's a serious problem, obviously, for Iran. And again, they they were aware of this. So, as a result. Um, one of the things that the U.S. agreed to do, and it was an absolutely critical issue, and I, I talked with the Iranians about this in Vienna, uh, and they were very clear about this, that they were demanding that the United States had to agree uh, not just to cancel the sanctions that were explicitly mentioned in the agreement, the uh, 
the unilateral sanctions and, of course, the UN sanctions, but that the United States government had to educate, inform uh, the banks and uh, other uh, business institutions around the world that it was now okay to do business with Iran. Um, and and I, they didn't go into detail about it, but it was it seemed very clear that the U.S. had to uh, carry out a very vigorous campaign of of education around this issue. And, and I think that's really what we're what is at issue now in terms of the um, of the Iranian complaints and the defensiveness of the Obama administration. Um, and it's my view that the Obama administration. Uh, wants to do everything within the letter of the agreement that it was required to do, and it wants to convince the Iranians that it's doing that. And so it's, it's done a number of things. It's, it's done a lot of things. Um, but whether the effect is going to be what the Iranians would like is another question. I, I, I can't address that except that we know that there have been complaints on the Iranian side. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that issue is not a simple one to resolve, obviously. Yeah. So I think that's where that issue stands um, in terms of of the, uh, the the problem of lifting sanctions going beyond the um, the the letter of of the agreement. Yeah. So I saw a statement by the Ayatollah, or well, what was you know reporting purporting to be a statement of the Ayatollah anyway, Gareth, saying, you know, the, the sneaky Americans, you know how they are, and here they go. They're not living up to their side of the deal. They've they've found their loopholes, and and they're going to do this. And I guess you're saying the, the Obama administration is kind of going the, the, well, not the extra mile, it was part of the deal, that they would educate business on how you can now do business with Iran now and, and, and et cetera, except that the point is there's still so many American sanctions that it basically sort of makes that besides the point or it makes it not amount to the sanctions relief the Iranians were expecting. Well, there there are a lot of nuances here that have to do with, uh, you know, what the expectations were, you know, the meaning of 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 what various uh, obligations was, how, how it was understood on both sides. And, and I'm quite sure that, that there is a, that there are differences in terms of exactly what each side expected, uh, would be done. Um, and I mean, that's, that seems to be inevitable. But I mean, um, I guess what, uh, the point that I would make is that from the Iranian point of view, they are bound to be suspicious that the United States did not do enough. They, they were not sitting in the boardroom when you know, meetings were held, uh, obviously. So, so they are not, um, they're not able to judge, uh, directly, uh, I don't think what, what happened, but they are bound to be suspicious and rightly so, because, uh, as, as I've said elsewhere, um, you know, the United States wants to convince Iran that it is doing uh, you know, it, it is fulfilling its obligations under the agreement, but at the same time, it clearly, you know, does not want Iran to recover fully economically. I mean, the United States wants to keep Iran as weak as possible. So therefore, there is a conflict of interest uh, between, you know, the United States overall posture toward Iran and their obligations uh, and carrying out their obligations under this agreement. So that's bound to produce some degree of ambiguity and and conflict over this issue. Yeah, but within the realm of uh or you know not not bad enough to to really lead to a breaking of the deal you don't think though easily it's resolvable not, it's not going to lead to a breakdown of the deal i'm i'm pretty sure i don't think it's in the interest of the iranians to try to pick it apart to the point where you know it falls apart i mean they 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 have certainly gained they will gain economically from the deal even though it doesn't go as far as they would like it to go that's for sure yeah um, and um, and furthermore, I think politically they are uh, gaining by their ability to deal with Europeans in much more uh, satisfactory fashion than they could uh, before the agreement was reached. And there's no doubt in my mind they recognize that as a huge gain for themselves. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's 
kind of been the hope once we get these markets open and you start getting more and more vested interest uh, invested in the new status quo in in right. peace and trade, then the better off we all are, you know. And then, then of course, one has to recognize that there are huge differences uh, politically between and among various segments of the political elite in uh, in Iran. I mean, there are uh, people, including the supreme leader himself, who are uh, very not just suspicious of the United States. But um, are are not uh, interested in having this agreement lead to closer relations with the United States. Uh, so, and that's different from you know my understanding certainly of uh, the viewpoint of Zarif and and I think Rouhani as well mm. that they would like to see this agreement lead to other forms of cooperation, and I think that it would be uh, in Iran's interest to see that happen. I, I think that that's a, that's a big, uh, sort of gulf between two different views of, of that question. So, you know, the people who are much more, uh, negative about, uh, any possible, uh, future cooperation with the United States are, are bound to make more of this than those people who would like to, even, even if it's limited, uh, cooperation, uh, you know, to, to various issues surrounding Iraq and, and Syria, possibly, um, th- they are much more willing to give the United States uh, the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. All right. And now I'm sorry to waste your time with this, but if you give me just one more minute, uh, missile tests, missile tests, uh, we're all going to die. And they wrote <laughs> that they hate Israel on the front of the missiles, too. How do you like that? Well, yeah, assuming that that is accurate, and I, I don't at this point have any basis for saying that it's not true that there wasn't a um, an anti-Israel um, uh, logo or or uh, saying on the on a missile or or more than one missile. I believe it was originally reported by Fars News, so that either yeah. means it's complete BS or it must be true, whichever you like. Well, I mean, I think it's probably true, um, and and I think this reflects the. Um, uh, not just the the, the uh, actual politics, the political views of of uh, the IRGC, which is in charge of these missile tests, um, or at least has a great deal to do with them. Um, but but it also, you know, it seems to me very clear that it's uh, in the interests of the IRGC to do their best to um, uh, to screw things up in terms of relations between Iran and the United States to the maximum degree possible, mm-hmm. um, at least in regard to, um, you know, making sure that that things don't get too cozy uh, with regard to U.S. presence in Iran, which they would regard as a as a very big uh, a danger to, to the system in Iran. So in other words, you're saying that America's hawks, when they freak out about stuff like this, they're serving the interests of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps? Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, they are aligned perfectly, or not perfectly, but not perfectly, but with, to a great extent, the the uh, the, the pro-Israel uh, hardliners in this country are very closely aligned with the anti-American, uh, the most extremely anti-American uh, hawks, if you will, in uh, in Iran, which is, you know, among them are the IRGC. Um, and so, I mean, we've seen this happen, of course, time and again over the last couple of years. We know that the, uh, that the, uh, hardline Republicans who, you know, maneuvered that crazy letter, uh, sent to, uh, to the Iranians were counting on that effect, mm-hmm. precisely on that effect. They were looking for their allies to speak up and do something that would somehow make it easier to defeat the, the agreement. Uh, in the United States. So, you know, all this, all these, uh, uh, these dynamics, uh, on both sides really, uh, do fit together quite well. What a shame. Well, uh, they, you know what? Um, they were overcome, those hawks on both sides, in order to get this deal in the first place. And as you say, despite the troubles, it looks like it's sticking for now. So, you know, and let it, the hawks it, squawk. Uh, we, we, we have to wait for, uh, somebody to be elected president before I think we really start worrying about uh, about what what's going to happen to this agreement. Then I think then we should start worrying. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure out of who's left who'd be worse than any or, or better than any of the others at this point on this issue. Do you have an opinion on that, or is even Bernie better than any any of the others on this? 
I, I think Kasich and uh, Sanders would would be very strongly supportive of the agreement, and I think uh, the other candidates, uh, in varying degrees, would be uh, to somewhat or extremely threatening to to the agreement. And uh, you know, again, I, I think I've said on your show previously that uh, in the end, I suspect that even a Ted Cruz, who would be the worst, uh, would bow to the views of the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, and and agree that uh, this is too dangerous for the United States to rip it up and start over again. So Kasich is actually good on it, is that right? I'm not saying he's good. I'm saying that he is much he's he's least uh he's he's least crazy on the republican side i guess he did say something in the debate about well it is a deal it's on paper and we have to see how it goes and that yeah, kind of yeah. thing that's I mean, what you're I, referring to right he's he's not a crazy he's he's not surrounded by people who are dying to go to war with iran um i'm not ready to say the same thing about ted cruz at all um and trump who knows who knows what he's going to think i mean i you know I just, he's, he's too much of a question mark. No <laughs> Cruz is palling around with Michael Ledeen and yeah, Frank yeah. Gaffney. <laughs> exactly, exactly. God help he's, us. He, he's, he's the thing, the closest thing to an absolute threat to this, to this agreement. Um, and, and with, with Hillary, I mean, you know, one would have to be afraid of, you know, sort of nibbling around the edges of it, uh, to the point where, it, you know, it would create, it would create some severe problems. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Yeah. At Definitely. least. All right. Well, listen, uh, I'll let you go. Thank you again for coming on the show, Gareth. I sure appreciate it, man. Thank you, Scott, as always. All right, y'all. That's the heroic Gareth Porter. He writes at Middle East Eye and at truthout.org. And you can find his archive going back for years and years at original.antiwar.com slash Porter. And buy his book. Buy two of them and give one to your local library, Manufactured Crisis, the truth behind the Iran nuclear scare. Thanks, y'all. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime future freedom author Scott McPherson. Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. Hey, I'll Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make the show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co.